Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first episode of season two of Hashtag Beyond the Canon um, BTC Writers Room. Um, we are so thrilled to have Christopher Diaz with us. Uh, Christopher is an American playwright, screenwriter, and educator. His play, The Elaborate Entrance of Chad Dieti, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2011. The New York Times awarded Diaz the, with the Outstanding Playwright Award. Um, previous credits include a stage adaptation of Disney's Hercules for the Public Theatre and a screen adaptation of the musical Rent for Fox. His work has been also featured on, a Netflix, on Netflix and ESPN. Diaz currently teaches at New York University. Thank you so much for coming on uh, VTC Writers Room. We are so thrilled to have you. Oh, so incredibly honored. Thank you so much, Chris. Honestly, but I've got to ask though, why ESPN? What's the connection? <laughs> it's a little bit of a, of a strange thing. I have a friend who I grew up with who um, is a producer for ESPN and they were doing, this is gonna sound so dumb. They were doing the anniversary of this thing called the butt fumble which is the thing that happened in the NFL where one player ran into a player on his own team and basically just ran into the other guys behind and dropped the ball and they lost the game because of it. And it was basically this internet meme for a long time mm -hmm. and they wanted to do an anniversary like series of things to celebrate it. So I went in with my friend Desmond, who was a star of, of Chad D in, in uh, New York and Chicago and LA. And we shot this like two minute video about a guy running into another guy's butt. The butt fumble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's fun. It was like a dream. It was like a dream to do something for ESPN. I'm a big sports fan. I grew up on ESPN, but you know, it's always when we get to that question, like, what was it? It's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you was expecting that. You were like, okay, I'm ready for it. Now I'm gonna ask you a question around Disney. Okay, so your yeah. is was Hercules your go-to, or was that something that just came up? And if it wasn't your go-to, what is your Disney go-to or a Disney flick that you wish that you could adapt? That's a yo. That's a great question. I it, from that second question, I would say Hercules is the one to like to adapt. Like the ones that have gotten adapted already um were really great you know like I, I i was a big aladdin guy growing up um i think probably because like i was in love with princess jasmine like i just like had a big <laughs> with princess jasmine um and then uh but they made that one and and lion king obviously and i mean lion king is like the the musical is so good the the stage musical is so good um so i loved all of them i think they're really incredible i think they're just the way that they're done is really great and and hercules is is the music is so good. The story is so complicated. And, you know, there was so much work to still do on that. But the opportunity to work with Alan Menken, who is, you know, the, the guy basically who saved Disney and changed sort of the face of everything was really like the big thing to jump at. So to be able to get to play with that was like a dream, total dream. Amazing. You know, one thing that we always uh, sort of ask our writers is um, we always ask them, who do you write for? So Chris, who do you write for? <sighs> It's a it's a it's a it's a deeper question um, than I think I would have thought immediately. Like I write I write for myself. Like I do it because it helps me. It helps me like figure out who I am, and and we'll talk about that later. I'll save some of that for when we talk about some of, one of my shows later. Um, but um, so I do that. But also I I think about when I was in high school and when I was in college. I went to NYU and I used to go see like. 150 180 shows a year i would go three four times a week to go see theater and sometimes it was broadway sometimes it was like off 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 broadway <laughs> and but i would go to broadway and i would intentionally dress the way that i'm dressed today i would have a hoodie on like big baggy jeans like my tims on like my 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 um my hat you know and i was the only person there and i think like that would that looked like that and i would end up sitting next to you know these like 60 70 year old women often and watching like seven guitars i remember watching august wilson seven guitars sitting next to these like old you know these older women and um having really great conversations with them and so i guess to, i say that to answer my question is like, I try to write a little bit for those people, for those young people. They can be people of color. They can be people from whatever different kinds of backgrounds, but who find themselves in a room where they don't feel like they fit necessarily. 
and I want them to know they do fit. You have the right to be here. You have the opportunity to have your voice heard the same way anybody else does. And you can participate in this great, you know, tradition of storytelling that's gone on, you know, longer than, you know, than, 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 than the countries that we live in, longer than, you know, the societies that we come from. So um, I would say that. And so let's have your thoughts on the representation of the of, of Latinx playwrights. Um, sort of. So as I'm always like looking at what can be learned, like how can we rebuild the industry, mm. right? Um, when we think about sort of like post pandemic, mm. you know, what is how are we reimagining the arts? How are we reimagining entertainment? So what's your hopes and 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 sort of vision for the future? There are so many great people of color of all different backgrounds, so many great Latinx, Latino, whatever, you know, however people describe themselves, um, writers out there, especially, you know, on that new play development level. So when you go out, I work a lot in those fields where you write a play, you submit it out, maybe at the, you know, it goes to the Actors Theater of Louisville, maybe it goes to a smaller theater company um, who's developing new stuff. Uh, maybe you're a playwright who's gotten a, um, a fellowship at New Dramatists or one of those other things. And whenever I go to those, I find myself surrounded by great Latino playwrights, playwrights of, you know, from, from Central and South America, or from the Caribbean, from the United States, who's, who's you know, the, the descendants of those folks. And um, those writers are out there. Then I go to Broadway, right? I'm a Tony voter. Um, and I go to Broadway and I'm like, oh, right, they're not here. Like, we're not, we're not here in the same way. You know, Lynn uh, Manuel Miranda is, um, and a lot of folks are sort of coming up and around that Kiara Hoodies. Kiara Hoodies is like well, the best writer in the United States. And, you know, she's, she's produced off Broadway. She's produced in regionals. It's not the same, the same sort of thing. So I think about the ways in which we can establish, um, I don't know, establish ground in these, in these larger uh, theatrical settings. Um, some of that I think is a matter of time. Like the fact that Kiara has like, is it two, a Pulitzer and two Pulitzer finalist nominations? Like she, she's, she's formidable. Um, and we have folks who are formidable. We have, we have performers who are formidable now. Um, you know, people who are, are, who sell tickets, sell tickets on television, sell tickets in the movies. And maybe some of them start to do theater in some ways, but I also just want like the writers who are out there who are killing it who've been killing it for 20 years 30 years 40 years 50 years um to get their their recognition too so i think that some of that has to do with amplifying doing the kind of work that you all are doing like advocating for folks and just making some noise um i also think it's it has to do with getting into the rooms that make where those decisions are made so sitting on the board of directors somewhere being the artistic director or the assistant artistic director somewhere associate um just learning how to like i go i sit whenever i'm asked to be on an awards panel or you know a panel that's going to give a fellowship to somebody i try to get on into those rooms not to just say that like oh this person has a z in their last name like they're going to win because they're martinez like it's it's not that but to be able to say like i understand the traditions that this person is operating in and um and again to be able to amplify from that perspective do you think that um the struggle necessarily for representation because you've written for both theater and film like do you think the struggle for representation is different or altered based on the medium or is it like an even playing field i think it's you know it's similar i mean it, it, it's it's interesting right now in tv is such a such a weird time because there are so many tv shows um and then there's so many opportunities and so you know we're seeing a lot of great writers of my generation and a lot of latino writers latinx writers who are um who have just moved to television who have just stopped working in the theater and moved to television i mean somebody like tanya Siracho, who's a great uh playwright who now you know produces her own shows and runs her own show she's run she's run vita for a long time and it's you know she's making exactly what she wants to make um, so in some cases, I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in TV. There's just more opportunity in TV to get the kind of job that's actually going to pay you and, and give you health insurance and do all of those things. Um, and then on the other side, there are writers in the theater who've been doing it, like I said, for many, many, many years and have created space for themselves. So there's room in both. Um, I think the, the, the challenges that are similar 
are a few things. If you're writing multilingual work, which I don't, I don't speak Spanish. Um, I wish I did. But um, but if you write multilingual work, you're always going to have a barrier. Um, you're always going to run into a case where, you know, the gatekeep, the quote unquote gatekeepers, the producers, the the literary people, if they don't, if they literally don't understand your language, you're already at a deficit. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one thing. And then the flip side, maybe sort of the extreme flip side of that is the expectation for a Latinx writer that you have to write about a certain kind of work. You know, this is the same for, you know, the, the African-American writer, the Asian-American writer, where it's like, oh, great. Like, you know, you're, you're an African-American writer. You're going to write, it's going to sound like August Wilson, or it's going to be in the, you know, the quote unquote, the ghetto, and it's going to be a struggle again. And maybe that's the work you do, but maybe that's not what you actually want to do. So I think that, you know, that that challenge feels real all the way around and the ability for folks to just write the things that that they want to write, write the things that they only they can write um, and, and you know, and, and get the support in developing it and, and getting it to the finish line. That's, you know, I, I hope that that challenge is something we can overcome. Okay, I want to talk about you, Christopher. I'm going to call you Chris because you said mm-hmm. that I can. <laughs> and I feel like we're friends now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I really want to talk to you about your own work. Like I, everyone will tell you, Saru told you earlier, I'm a great fan of your work. And in particular, like I love the elaborate entrance of Chad. <laughs> So, um, deity and I think it's just, yeah there it is oh hold it up hold it up for longer <laughs> put it in front of my face I don't know if it's if I'm backwards if I'm flipped on here but no yeah, you're perfect okay, okay good you get the oh idea. my gosh okay so I love that is like my favorite I go I went I went on and on and on about it and I actually got to see it I got to see it perform in Chicago so I was oh, like nice. think about that um, anyway, it's won like the Obie Awards for um, like Best American Play and the Lucille Awards for Outstanding Play. I mean, come on. Like, but did you I always think about this, especially when um, I think about like my favorite songs? And I'm like, when you're writing something like that, do you go, man, this is a hit? Like, when do you know that it's a hit? And then, like, the <laughs> second part of this question is like, how did you, when you were writing it, like, how did you, did you expect that same positive reaction from audience members as well as press, as well as, you know, we talk about these sort of award committees, but did you, you know, when was it, when did it land for you to say, look, I'm writing something that's going to be dope. It's going to, it's going to really sort of take off. Yeah. It, I, I never thought it was going to be a, a hit. Um, I never thought it was going to, you know, I didn't know if it was going to connect with people, but I knew pretty early on that I was writing a thing. I really, I, I was getting it. You know, it, it, it doesn't always happen. You know, you write, you bang your head against the wall. You were like, I wanted to do this, but I'm not sure it wants to be this. I want, but like early on in that process, I was like, yeah, this is right. This is good. This is like, this is me. And, and like I was saying before, there's nobody else can write this thing. You know, and that's not, that's not, I don't mean that in an egotistical kind of way, like, look at how good I am. I mean, like, this is a unique thing. And it's about a person like myself. It's about somebody who grew up as a big wrestling fan, which I did. It's about a person who had a certain view of the world and, um, and wrestling played a role in that and race played a role in that. And, you know, the particular moment when I was writing it was at the, the sort of like the build up to um, Obama's first um, president's first, first term. And um, so it was in response to all of, of, of Bush number two's second term. And it was just this particular moment. And I was, as I was writing that first act, not even the first act, the first monologue, uh, which opens it up, I was like, I'm getting it. I understand what I'm doing. And, um, and that, that the process of writing that whole first draft, basically it's split into sort of four parts. There's two acts. Um, there's a first, the very first part of the first act is this monologue, direct address monologue. And then there's a, a, an act, you know, the rest of the act proper, which is scenes and sort of back and forth. And then the second act is split into kind of, uh, similarly, there's, there's scenes back and forth and then an epilogue. For, so the prologue, that first act and the epilogue came out almost exactly as they, it's, they are in the final draft. Like wow. they, they, they came out. I mean, lots of tweaking, lots of yeah. editing, but the story was crystal clear to me. And um, 
And then that third act changes a zillion times. That the beginning of the second act to the epilogue changed a million times. We've worked on it through the original Chicago production, through the New York production, through the LA production. Like we continue to work at it. But um, but but that stuff came out in a lot of ways fully formed because it was all the stuff that I had wanted to say for a long time. And to to actually answer your question, the question you asked instead of the question that I'm trying to answer, uh, when I got to the end of the play, and I wrote the last line of the play, I think I actually like stepped back and i was like yeah like that's that's for real mm. like like and i won't spoil it like read it but i was like okay, okay. <laughs> like this is actually like just the last line of the play like to be able to sum up what i was trying to do and and it's complicated i get a lot of questions about it um but it was it was right so it, it clicked into place in a big way i never would have thought that it would have been i never would thought it would have been in the pulitzer conversation like I, this is my first production so you don't think that but like I did what I wanted to do and uh that's beautiful you can, tell mean, her, you can tell her early go ahead and it's fantastic because it's it's so beautiful when all of those things align mm -hmm. and your authentic voice your your passions your everything is on the page right everything yeah. is there I mean it's so beautifully constructed and it does feel it's, it's really strange because sometimes you can even when you're reading it or when you're seeing something it plays out it feels effortless like you're just sinking into the story you're sinking into these characters and you're just going on the ride man like and, then, and that's how it is like sorry i could talk so long about no, that play it, i loved it that's a beautiful thing to hear i mean the other thing that i will say for sure is when we were doing the show in chicago the original production we did a workshop of it uh, we did a reading of it the year before, and then we did another workshop production of it. And one of the one of the blessings of that production is is I got paired up with exactly the right director, Eddie Torres. I got paired up with exactly the right actors, mm -hmm. particularly Desmond Borges, who we knew from the time. Uh, the 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 literary manager of Victory Gardens Theater at that time was a guy named Aaron Carter, and he read it. And he picked it from the pile and he said, two, he said, he said, I love this play. I understand this play. He said, and I know who's, who should be in it. And that makes a huge difference. And, and so Desmond Borges had just come out of school, um, at a, at a uh, acting school and it was like exactly right for the part. He's grown he's, he's gone on to be like one of my best friends and, and the guy I did the butt fumble with among other things. Um, <laughs> and then he also said, we know who's going to play VP is this guy named Usman Ali. And he, he, um, is a performer here in, in, in Chicago who is just killing it and can do all of this work. And both of those guys came in very early in the process and got it too. And, you know, and so be able to go from Chicago to New York to LA with them um, and Eddie, the director and a bunch of other folks who came into the process at various times, you know, just like you said, effortless, obviously not effortless because like it killed us mm -hmm. um, and it was hard, but like, it was right. We were all going in the same direction and, you know, it, it was, it's a dream, it's a dream. That's such a beautiful thing. And I'm so happy to hear that that the process, especially as it was your first your first um, play, um, that it happened in that way. I mean, we hear so many writers that haven't had that same experience, right? There's a lot of um, people in positions that scratch their heads when they have to think about what actors <laughs> that they can um, cast um, yeah. and what directors as well. Do you know what I mean? Like that is so amazing to hear that. Um, I wonder if there's any other sort of play in your repertoire that you felt that, not that you go into it like this, but you felt that didn't necessarily get the response or the acclaim that you felt that it deserved? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, the, my, my very first play, the play that I wrote as my, my thesis project at NYU is a, a, a play called Welcome to Arroyos, which is out in the world. And um, gets gets produced a lot in in, in um, colleges these days. I love it. It's you know it's 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 my baby, and um, I think it's out there in the world. I think people know about it a little bit. But I, if you like if you like Chad Deity, I recommend um, um, Welcome to Royals a lot. And then you know I, I just because I think it's um, really good, and I think unfortunate circumstances change the perception of it. I loved our rent. I think the rent that we did was like really special. And um, the process was special. I got to go through the process with Michael Greif, who's one of my all-time, you know, theater idols. Um, and I went through most of that process sit sitting or standing next to Julie Larson, Jonathan Larson's sister, and um, 
crying together <laughs> and just like hugging each other every time they sang and those beautiful voices happen. I mean, Brandon Victor Dixon is like the greatest musical theater voice that I know and his performance was incredible and everybody involved in that show was incredible and really special. And, you know, I, I highly recommend both it, for folks who didn't get to see it, get a chance to check it out. And um, if you get a chance to see any of the live stuff that we did that night, I mean, the story around that is crazy. The night before we were gonna do it, one of our leads fell down in the very last minute, broke his foot, and we couldn't do the live performance on Sunday night. We used the tape performance on Saturday night, which was still, I think, really strong. But then that Sunday night, we, um, we were airing the taped performance, but we were doing some live stuff that night with mm -hmm. Jordan Fisher and, and um, uh, Tinashe and like just, just this incredible group of people performing and just like everybody's just crying the whole time. And game changer. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big, 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 big advocate of what we did there. That's amazing. Okay. We definitely need those links. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. So that if you haven't watched them, if you haven't yeah. read them, then like get to know, get to know this work. <laughs> It sounds really, really special. I love that. And I, and I think one of the things that I really kind of connect with with what you're saying is the part where you just, you touch on everything that you love and everything and you just bring yourself into your work. You know, I get your, ref, your wrestling thing. I'm a mass, mad ref, like wrestling fan. When I was a kid, I mean, I'm talking old school wrestling. For me, I guess that would be like Owen Hart, Bret Hart, you know, Jake the Snake days. I lived. <laughs> over my head. Like Sari was talking to me and I was like, that. seriously. And I'm absolutely, absolutely fascinated with the Lucha Libre. Like I just mm -hmm. like, was it always your intention to incorporate that into Chad Beatty? Or was it like something that came later or it was just like goals? Yeah, it started there. I mean, I, I grew up a obsessive wrestling fan. I mean, it was like what I did, you know, from the time I was like five, six years old till probably high school I probably stopped in high school and then went got back into it because when I I, I apologize Sam we're gonna go off into <laughs> I am <laughs> so she said Owen Hart I was like all right we're in so so like when I when I get to high school and college um it's when the uh actually when I'm in college is when the NWO happens it's when Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock and a, a company called the ECW have so wrestling becomes like cool again for a moment. And I know the rock like, just been out there. I know the rock. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's funny because the rock, we I, we used to watch I used to watch the rock in 19, you know, 1998. And I was like, yo, this guy is he's not just like a good wrestler, like he's for real. Like he's like he's hilarious and he's charismatic yeah. and all this stuff. And you see it 20 years later, like he's the biggest star, yeah. like literally the biggest star in the world. Mm. Um, because he's got performance skills that nobody else has. But I got back into it at that point. And um, that was when, and then I went to graduate school and I had written, I tried to write a screenplay about wrestling at some point and I sort of put it in my pocket. And then um, when I got out of graduate school, I, I had been trying to, to get into the theater business and I was writing quite a bit. And I had written Welcome to Arroyos and people were like into it, but not, people said like, we love this play. We can't produce it. Like, what else do you have? And I didn't get it. And I saw like lots of people around me who, not necessarily people I went to school with, people I went to school with, I you know, I had a lot of respect for. This is gonna sound terrible, but I would see people getting produced and I would say, like, their work is fine, but it's not it's not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I don't I don't mean that egotistically, but I mean it like that's the feeling that you have. And I feel like as a young writer, that's the feeling you should have, right? Like you should yeah, believe. That's, that's real, Chris. Real. That's real. So <laughs> So I was feeling that. And then one of the things in professional wrestling that's, you know, it's, it's mentioned in the play is that there are people whose job it is to um, make other people look like they know what they're doing. Like there are people in the, who are in the, in the ring, they're the ring general, they're actually doing all the work in the ring. And the, somebody like The Rock, Rock is very talented, but somebody like The Rock can just sort of like smile and pose and, you know, and, and get ahead that way. And so I was feeling that. And there was something about that that made me connect to, 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 to that. And it helped me find a character. And then once I found out, I was like, oh, I can write a character who feels unappreciated, who's really good at what he does, doesn't have it. That was sort of the, sort of the end. So it was always, that play always was meant to be about uh, wrestling. And then the other stuff, the political stuff sort of came into it um, once I was, once I was in the process. Ah. So what is, um, if I can digress, start talking about wrestling so Sim can take <laughs> 
Thank you. You know, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. No, I, I, I love this conversation. I do. Podcasts need more wrestling. That's what's lacking. <laughs> but yeah, if I can just ask you, like, what does literary success look like to you? Man, that's it's a hard question. Again, like, I, I, <clears throat> it's a really tough question. I, I, it, doing chat deity doing it the way that we did it doing it with the people that i got to do it with mm. was a success um we didn't quite get the production that we wanted to get we didn't make it to broadway we were supposed there, there was a lot of talk that we were going to go to broadway at a certain point um and it didn't go because like we got good reviews in new york but not the kind of reviews that we would have needed to get um so you know it, it, it fell short in a lot of ways but what we did i could not be pr more proud of and um, the, the night that we opened in Chicago or the night that we performed for a student group in New York City. And we talked to these kids who were mostly, you know, Puerto Rican, Dominican kids from uptown, from, from, um, from Washington Heights, actually. And we did a talk back with them afterwards and they talked, you know, it was just the realist. And we were just like, this is it. This is what we were trying to do. Um, so that part of it is great. It opened up a lot of doors for me. It got me the opportunity to work in television. It got me the opportunity to work on um, uh, the musicals that I'm working on and things like that. So that level of it is definitely, you know, there's a lot of success already, I would say, in terms of like higher than I would have expected when I was learning how to do this thing. Um, there's still a lot ahead. You know, I still want to get to Broadway. Um, I would love for Chad Didi to go to Broadway someday even still. Uh, I think we should have been there a long time ago. Um, but, um, you know, I think there's still a lot of goals. I would love to do a television show of my own. I would love it. So I think there's still a lot of places to go. But it's a fun, um, refreshing place to be to know, like, I feel, I already feel like I've accomplished the, the artistic thing that I want to accomplish. And it, it's freeing, I guess. It lets me, lets, lets me focus on, on uh, 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 exciting things going forward. Let's talk about challenges. I mean, you've spoken about some of the challenges challenges that you've faced, but what has been, I guess, the the biggest challenge you've overcome in your profession? It's hard. I think it's it's still ongoing. The, the business is hard. The mm. business is hard to begin with. And one of the weird things about being a playwright is you get a little success as a playwright and then you get asked to do other stuff. So it's not there's not a whole lot of room as a playwright for financial success. There's not a path as a playwright to getting health insurance um, in this country. Um, so you do other opportunities present themselves and then you have to retrain yourself to do different things. Retraining yourself to write for a television show is a whole different beast or write for a musical or, or, or a film. So that thing that I can't just continue to do the thing that I'm trained to do of just write plays um, it's challenging, I would say, you know, like you, you're constantly learning and shifting and adjusting. Um, I mean, I continue to write plays, but, you know, but, but the, the, the focus gets, gets spread out. Um, the other thing, honestly, is <laughs> you, you, you get access to some other, to new rooms. And that part of it, I feel like, is, 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 is good in terms of, you know, getting to talk to different artistic directors, getting to work with new collaborators, um, sometimes people of color, sometimes not people of color. And you, me, me, I sometimes um, still have that difficulty of figuring out my place in a room figuring out what my voice is, figuring out how people are hearing the things that I'm saying, mm -hmm. figuring out what um, they're missing, um, figuring out when you're working with somebody, an artistic director or um, a collaborator or whoever they might be, a producer of some sort, and they say something that's just wrong. They say something that's off. They misunderstand something. They, 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 they bring a certain cultural lack of knowledge to the table figuring out your place within that and figuring out you know how much of that is like oh was that actually like something that i gotta get tough about like do i have to actually you know like they just said something that made me get a little like the bronx back in me or like a little like whatever that is like do i need to do that in this situation or do i need to sit back in this situation or am i by sitting back am i permitting what's going on right now 
when do you step up? When do you make your voice heard? I mean, this is a lot of what Chad Deity was about to begin with. Like, when do you, when, when, when is it right for you to, 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 to say exactly the thing that you feel? And when do you have to like check yourself? And um, that's an ongoing process. And I, I would say that I don't get it right <laughs> all the time, you know? Um, but it's always a learning process. But I think that, you know, you never get, you know, you feel on some level like, oh, I got this award or I almost got this award. I'm nominated for this. Like I get a certain amount of respect when I walk into a room. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe not. And maybe, you you know, so is, it, uh, negotiating all of that is still an ongoing challenge. Mm. Oh my gosh, I can so relate to you because I think it's so challenging just in terms of, um, because I think there's a cost either way, right? There's a cost if you say something and there's also a cost if you don't say, so <laughs> say something. There's a cost of your own sort of personal, you know, like well-being and just self really, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like if you don't say something, can you leave the room? And I've had that feeling as well where I'm mm. like, oh. And then when you say something, you're like, actually I've got to go back into that room at a later date, whether it's the next day, <laughs> whether it's an, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, and I have to then navigate that too. Um, so you don't say I, it, you don't say it and you hold it and you think like, oh, I handled that pretty well. I didn't curse that person out. You're right. And then you go home and you're like, ah, oh, but I still, yeah. <laughs> it's still here. It didn't go away. Yeah. You yeah. didn't vent or, or to even let off those emotions. So essentially what you're doing is instead of unpacking it, you're carrying it and yeah. then it's going for days on end. Oh Yeah. You know, and they don't, and they don't know, maybe, you know, like, you're like, oh, it's so obvious what they just said to me, but they don't know that it's obvious. And so, yes. you know, so, so it actually, there's some of it that is on you. It's not most, you know, some of it is on somebody else, but some of it is on you. Like, it's my job to solve this problem. I mean, I think that's always a, a, a burden that, you know, people of color, any sort of, you know, oppressed minority group, whatever it is, carries in the room is that you're aware of the things that are going wrong. You do have to do that work. And you do have to be bigger on some level, whether that means you have to be confrontational or not confrontational or swallow it or like, I don't know exactly what that is, but that's, I, I think that's very real. It's so real. It's so real. I mean, especially when you're doing the work, whether it's artistic work, whether it's other, you know, work in terms of, you know, I think of the, my Beyond the Canon hat on, but also my artistic directors of the future hat on as well, yeah. where I'm constantly in those positions of going against the, the, the status quo and, and having to hit across um, a strong case for why things need to change. And you're right, some people really don't even see it and they say things and you're like, oh, Oh, yeah. I need to challenge that. But maybe yeah. I'll do it today. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow. But that's going to be challenged. Um, <laughs> exactly. Know. And so. just and thinking about, you know, one of the things when I was younger, I think I was, it was easier for me to look at something and say like, oh, that's definitely wrong. Like that's an old way of thinking. It's definitely wrong. I'm going to fight against it. Now, as I get older, I've been in situations where the things from the old way of thinking they, they're not always wrong necessarily. Like I want to listen to, I still want to listen to what's being taught to me, you know, out working with Alan Menken. Um, Alan Menken is a genius and he may say something that is not in line with my way of thinking, not necessarily politically, but I mean like artistically, we have different ideas. So that ability to say like, I actually want to listen and I want to hear and I want to learn from these people that I'm working with and I'm, you know, that, that they're teaching me things potentially. Mm -hmm. I want to hold that. But I also want to make sure that I'm not just agreeing to something being done the way it was always done because it was the way it's always been done. I want to be able to like express what I feel is right and find space and, 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 and common ground and collaboration too. So it's hard. You get it on all different sides yeah. and to be able to like advocate and listen is, is, is just no joke. Yeah. I think the best, the best, um, the best way to advocate is to be able to listen in order to know what you're advocating for, right? Like, I feel like there's those of people like, let's just change everything. And you're a bit like, okay, that's great. But what does that really mean? You know, what does that really look like? And how is it done? Do you know what I mean, so I'm all for strategy. Sorry? Mm -hmm. And who is it for? I feel yeah. like sometimes we kind of just rage against the machine sometimes. And sometimes we're, we're so 
focused on changing something, but we don't really understand the ripple effect of what that change will kind of look like and what it's going to be like the next day and for who and for how, and whether that change will be easily as accessible or readily available for other people. Like, I, I always feel like change it's, 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 it's almost like a commodity at times. And I, I don't know, like in my, in my experience, I found sometimes people, they fight for change, but then it's only for your change or yeah. the change that impacts yourself and you're okay yeah. in your corner. And then it's no longer just about the community or us as a whole or us as we move forward. It's just, you're okay. And that, that can be so sad at times. Oh my gosh, that is so key. And again, we could go, Chris, like, seriously, you're one of those people that's so easy to speak to. Like, we could speak <laughs> for hours. Seriously, yeah. there's so much to cover. So maybe we have to come, you have to bring you back on because we've got so much to go through. Yeah, Chris, I'm going to move us on. I'm going to move us on. Um, okay. So let's talk about fellowships, can yeah. we? Because <laughs> you have secured a lot of fellowships. A lot of fantastic fellowships as well. And I say that from someone looking from the outside in, so you can tell me if they are fantastic or not once you're on the ground, right? And you're you're in there. But um, they can be like extremely, I really think about writers and I think about, you know, you hit the nail on the head and we're talking about how do you sustain yourself? And there's one thing about diversifying, you know, um, you know, who what medium you write for but there's another thing around how do you just sustain yourself generally and the fellowships definitely seems like the go-to but the demands and for them um because of, for that very reason i just think it's really really high and you've been associated with like some of the best i'm thinking of sort of the guggenheim fellowship um at this point but can you like demystify the process and then can you offer any tips or any suggestions to how to maximize the experience once you get the, if you're so lucky to get the experience? That's, that's great. That, you know, that second one is, it's a little case by case. So like mm -hmm. the Guggenheim, for example, is like a later career thing and they just give you money. Like you, you say, I'm going to write this. I'm going to try this. This is what I've done. This is what I like to do. And the Guggenheim looks at a bunch of different people and says, like, we support this writer. We support this writer's idea. Like, go ahead here. We're going to give you some, some cash. Um, and this cash is for you to figure out what you're going to do with. So those are great. Those are the best ones when they just give you money. And then you say, I'm going to do the work. Um, and then delivering on those, like do, actually doing work during that time is a big deal. It helps you, you know, with the with future ones down the road. Um, there are other ones that have really specific expectations. And, um, you know, if you get the opportunity to go work with a theater company, that's one of the best things that you can do, you know, develop with, with people, develop for people, listen to what they need, um, tell them what you need, figure out what the intersection between those things is and, and go out and make your work. Um, you just try to deliver. If you, if you do get it, you try to write and try to actually, if you tell them that you're, that you're going to accomplish a certain kind of thing, you do your best to go after that thing. If for some reason that doesn't happen, but you get distracted and work on something else, just make sure that it's, you know, it's good and it's strong and it's unique. Um, I think is, is, is the big thing. Um, in terms of how to get them, um, I think was, was, was sort of question one, yeah. um, you know, the, the, I, I also read on a lot of these things now. I read for fellowships and awards and all that. And the first thing is the uniqueness of your voice. Um, whenever I go through stuff, if I'm listening to musicals or I'm reading plays, the plays, the, the, the things that jump up immediately are the ones that aren't like things that I've read before. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it should just be chaotic and different for the sake of, of being different, but that come from a unique place. Um, I have a career because the first play that I wrote was a hip hop theater play about, um, the Lower East Side of New York city. It had DJs on stage. It had graffiti on stage. Um, it had two narrators sort of speaking at the same time. <clears throat> it just didn't look like anything else. And, um, and people then were able to either look at that play and say like, Oh, I really like this. Or like, I remember like, who wrote this? This is different. There's something different about this. Like, I'm going to remember that. And then later on, when I wrote Chad Deity, came out and folks were like, who wrote this? Oh, maybe was this was that guy who wrote that other thing. Like, he's got a thing that he does, and it's a unique lane that he lives in, right? Um, everything, because everything comes back to Hamilton, everything comes back to Lynn. Like, Lynn has done a similar kind of thing. Lynn has always been this unique creature, and unique in that he has written his hip-hop and done all that at the same time that his, like, 
musical theater side of things is just immaculate. Like, it's just like, nobody does what he can do on the musical theater side and nobody can do what he can do on the hip hop theater side. So, um, or it's certainly not to the same degree. So being able to carve out that space for yourself. I mean, Jeremy O'Harris is like space carved, like Jeremy owns his space um, and can figure out all the different things that he's doing within that world. Kiara, Lenat is like, like um, Jackie Sibley's Drury. Like you can list all these people who are just like a Jackie Sibley's Drury play is like nothing that anybody else writes. You can yeah. find something and read it and say like, oh, Fairview, that was amazing who I bet Jackie did that you know what I mean like you find these things and so like that's what is as important like and I, I teach at NYU we teach people all the the rules and structures and like it's good to know that it's important to know that it's important for your work to actually work and to be sturdy on stage and for actors to be able to act it and for you know to exist in traditions all that stuff is really important too it's not to just say like just do whatever you want to do but writing the work that only you can write is the most important thing i think to me and that's it, that's true for fellowships that's true for getting your work produced it's true for finding the right people the right collaborators who want to work with you um you don't have to jump and take every opportunity that presents itself you you have to pr take the ones that that you get because they're going to help you continue to do the thing that you're trying that you set out to do in the first place so can I ask you just um, one other question? <laughs> this is not on our thing, but yeah. just because you are on the committee and you do read, you do read a lot of these submissions, what would you say is the common mistake then? Like, what is the common mistake that you see time and time again that isn't necessarily based so heavily on a sort of a, a case by case scenario? Like, what is what would you say is a common mistake? It's mm. a really, really good, hard question. You know, I don't, it, it, I don't know if it's mistakes. Um, because I don't know who the, the writers are, but I will say that like, the, one of the things that, I, that, that happens to me a lot, this happens when I watch shows, whatever, that feeling of like, it's good, it's well done, it's tight, doesn't feel like they care about it, doesn't feel like this person is like live or die over this thing. And I don't mean live or die, live or die is too much, but it doesn't feel like this is like a person saying like, everything that I have has to get out of me in this play and then pour it out to the, into the world. As you go further in your career, I would say not everything carries that. Like right now, like, you know, I do work, I get paid to do work and I get paid, you know, like, you know, so sometimes I'm doing work, anything that I'm working on, I'm lucky, knock on wood, I'm fortunate enough to be in a position that anything that I've worked on for the last 10 years has been something that I actually care deeply about at the same time that maybe, you know, so I'm, I'm in a lucky position there. But I would say, especially when you first start, like if this is your first piece, your first show, your second show, and it just kind of sits there, it's just like, you know, I want to follow the rules and make it, you know, like that. It, it's very rare that you're going to get ahead that way. Or it's very rare that I'm going to be moved by it. But the ones, the shows where people are just, it's messy. It's all over the place. But I'm like, oh man, they care. Something about this, this intangible, it feels like it really matters to this person. Um, and it feels unique. It feels well observed. It feels like, you know, I'm not going to see six of these. Um, those are the ones that I'm drawn to. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Thanks yeah. So that is incredibly good advice. That is so dope. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, Chris, I am so happy. <laughs> I think it's always really spectacular for us to have the space and you, to share your insight with us. We're coming to my favorite part of the BTC Writers Room, which um, for anybody who wouldn't know, we ask all of our playwrights to name three plays that they wish they had read prior to them starting their artistic journey before they became um, writers per se. And um, I don't know, it's always really interesting and really fascinating and I love your choices. So please, if you can take it away. It's, it, this is so hard to pick. Um, <laughs> and so I'm leaving out a bunch of people. Um, <laughs> and I just said Jackie and I'm like, oh man, there's one that I... <laughs> we are proud. I gotta throw not, in she didn't make the list. She didn't make the list, but, <laughs> but we are we are proud to present a presentation. Um, one of Jackie's earlier plays is yeah. just it's yeah. it's staggering, um, and I love it. And everyone should know that play. Um, no, I picked three, and I cheated for one. So maybe I, you know, the first one <laughs> that I picked is a play that actually made me probably made me do theater more than anything else. 
So I did know it at the beginning of my career, but I had to mention it. Um, and it's John Leguizamo's Spicarama. And um, it's a one man show. And it's more of the old kind of show that John used to do where um, now he does shows that are kind of him playing John and then drifting into a few other different characters. And it's almost like, almost like stand up, but really good stand up and really, you know, complicated. Um, but his old shows were real sort of like one person shows where he played a bunch of different characters. And he did a show called Mambo Mouth um, where he pay, played, I think, seven or eight unconnected characters. And then he did a show called Spikarama where he played seven or eight um, characters who were all members of a family. And he started out as the youngest brother who was this like nerdy hip hop kid with like big glasses and braces and asthma. And he was really excited and he was telling us this story. And I, I went to see it. I was either I was 17 or 18 years old. I saw it off Broadway. And, um, and I was like, oh yeah, that kid is me. Like that kid, he's exactly who I am either at that moment or who I was like three years ago. And then he goes on to play another character. And I was like, oh, that kid's not me, but there's parts of who that person, of that, who that character is that also live in my heart and in my personality. And he went on to play all the members of this family and every single one, I was like, oh yeah, that's another part. Oh, he got me. Oh, that's more. And it made me realize like what, what playwriting was and that, you know, one version of playwriting. And that's like, you, I do this when I teach. You're not gonna be able to see it in the light. Like your heart, like it consists of a bunch of different pieces. Like you cut it up like, like pizza and like you get, you know, you get different slices and you take the slice of the pizza and make a different character out of it. So it's like, I have a part of me that's like really confident and really arrogant. Well, I'm going to take a character and make that really confident, really arrogant part. But then I have this other part of me that's super introverted and super afraid and shy. I can make that a character too. And you split up the different parts of who you are and pour it into your work. And if you put them into conversation with each other, you put them into dialogue in some way, like you automatically get conflict and tension and you get conflict and tension that's going on within your own heart and mind. Mm. Somehow at like 17, 18 years old, that. in watching this dude do that, I was like, oh man, I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. <laughs> so, yeah. you know... And, and then he finishes and he bows and he does one of those bows, you know, where it's like you bow and you reach out and you point to the audience, like just generally like out to the audience. But I swear he was like pointing. <laughs> right to me. And I was like, yes, John, I will follow in your, you know, you want me to do this. I get it. I've told him this like, you know, years later, years later, we got to work together. Wow. You know. It's really exciting as well, because I, I honestly think like, even as you like recall the story, I feel like I can see you seeing this like it's, it's like the, the impact <laughs> it was so huge but even to this very day it's so palpable to, to, to watch you talk about this that's amazing yeah get excited about it and that's it like that's that's the thing like if you get if you get excited about it like then you should be able to do something with it. you should write it like we don't make enough money in this business to do something that's not like got you up and, and out of your seat and excited so you know Oh my God, yeah. I'm just spitting sort of mad envy for your students. Like, I wish I was a student in your class. <laughs> I'm like, man, I they think my, they've got it. <laughs> one of my mentors came to watch me teach uh, last year. And he's been, he's Michael Dinwiddie. I've been working with him for 20 years. He's, he's been, he's my teacher 20 years ago. And he came to serve my class. And he was like, dude, he was like, you teach too hard. Like, you relax. <laughs> I get excited. I get exci I'm like, ah, oh, come on, guys. <laughs> They're the best teachers. <laughs> that need passion. They're the best. <laughs> so, Chris, what's your second? What's the second uh, well, play that you that you wish you would have read? Again, there's like a million, but I went with um, Barbecue by Robert O'Hara. Mm -hmm. Robert is a genius. I think Robert is a legit genius. I, I don't I don't um, call a lot of people geniuses, but I think Robert is, um, and he's one of those people that can do. A bunch of different stuff. I think part of the reason why I consider him, you know, to be a genius is that he's a writer and a director. And you know, going back to to, to Slave Play, you know, he directed uh, the Broadway production of Slave Play, the Off Broadway and Broadway production of Slave Play. Um, and uh, and he also writes. He writes his own work, and he writes this work that is like transgressive in the best way. That it it understands the rules, the quote unquote rules of the theater of the form, um, understands what it's supposed to do, and then breaks them in order to help 
move its story along, move its emotional idea along, convey information, make people, um, you know, move people by it. And so barbecue is another one. I don't want to, I actually don't want to say almost anything about this show because I want people to actually, like, I highly recommend if you're going to read anything after this, don't read one of my plays. Go read Robert's play. Go read Slave. Um, I didn't agree, barbecue. guys. And also read barbecue because <laughs> barbecue is, is just, just because I can't talk about it. Um, it's, it's, it starts out and you think that it's one thing. And then by the second scene, it's something completely, completely different. And you don't know what the heck it actually is until two or three scenes later and you sort of start to figure it out and then just when you think you know what he's doing to you something else happens and he sends you to intermission and you're just like what did what did we just do and then the second act is a completely different thing and then you think you figured that out and then it becomes an entirely different thing it's you know you can break it down into its component parts that way but what's most important is that he's completely in control as a writer the whole time like he's there's no mm. question it's not a matter of like i wrote this far and then i didn't know what to do so i just did something else it's like it's from the beginning you're in good hands he sets you up in the first scene so that he can disrupt it and take you in a different place in the second scene um it's about race but it's not about race in the way that we think you know that you necessarily think it's going to be about race it's about um economics and class in the United States. It's about celebrity. It's about media. It's so good. Yeah. And sexuality as well is in there. Sexuality. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. He writes, yeah. you know, it's, then some of his other work is even more, you know, it, it, the other play in that collection is called Booty Candy. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, he's just, it, dude does not like, he does not, he's not afraid. And um, that's something that I think is a really important thing for any, any new writer to take. And then number three. <laughs> then number three is in a whole different direction. Um, it's um, Dominique Mariso's Detroit 67. Mm. And Dominique is another one of those writers. Yes, who, you know, I was happy to see this one on there. Dominique's my yeah. girl. Yes. You no, know, and, and until, you know, until recently, she didn't sort of have her, her moment. And, um, you know, now she does. I mean, Ain't Too Proud is fantastic on Broadway. I can't wait till that opens back up. Um, and it's just announced that um, uh, Skeleton Crew is going to go to Broadway when Broadway yeah. reopens. Skeleton Crew is part of a trilogy um, uh, of which uh, Detroit 67 is, I believe, the first was the first play um, from that. And it's just a good play. It's just like really well written. Um, the structure is impeccable. You can go back if you want to learn if you're a young up and coming writer and you want to just learn how to track what's going on in a play. Detroit 67 is a really good version of it. One thing happens in a scene, a million other things are actually happening, but one major event happens in each scene is one location. The world outside of that location is constantly applying pressure to that location, but you don't see it. We don't leave the room. It's a marvel of just like the restrictions of the, st of the stage. We're gonna be in this basement. Everything's gonna happen in this basement. We're never leaving. We're not doing any fancy tricks. Um, music plays an incredibly huge role. It's a play that's it's in, in, in Detroit in 1967. So it's all Motown. Motown is just informing every single moment of it. And in that way that Motown actually matters where it's not just the music, but it has to do with race and, and, and the, the political situation that's going on. And it's just, it's just real. And it's another one that's like, it's a well put together play that has Dominique's voice all over it. It just feels like her, the way she writes her characters, the way she writes her dialogue, the way she writes her stage directions. Like it is crystal clear who wrote that play. Um, and I adore it, I adore it. And it's, an, it's a really great, you know, something we were saying earlier, that ability to marry like the way things, you know, the rules and your own thing. And to understand that like, this comes from a tradition, not just of black plays, not just the August Wilsons and Lorraine Hansberry's and all of those sort of, you know, great, great, great African-American writers, but also like this is this exists in your Tennessee Williams tradition and your Arthur Miller tradition and all these, you know, play, play kind of, kind of traditions is, is goddamn good. Um, and I hope that it, you know, I, I hope that once, once, once Skeleton Crew is up and running, I would love to see the other two plays get, Produce on Broadway too. They deserve it. Oh my God, Detroit '67. That's one play. That's that is one of my favorite plays from Dominique. Like I think that she has poured her heart and soul in that play, and it shows. And yeah. you know her love for Detroit, but also just how 
conflicted that love can be you know what I mean just in terms of the times and the the history you know of Detroit and so um yes thank you for adding that one like you know fantastic so 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 brilliant so we're gonna do we're gonna move on now to one last bit and before we let you go Chris because Chris is like looking at the time like guys come on no no this is fun <laughs> this is like we've added like a segment to our um, BTC writers room which is called the lightning round I wish it feels like we should have like a sound effect or like, something that happens <laughs> I <don't think> so. <laughs> thank you Sarah. I appreciate that like something should happen there should be like yeah. lightning round anyway never mind. Oh, um, but <laughs> <laughs> um, this is when we'll ask you questions and you can only answer with one word answers or one sentence answers. It can't be longer than a sentence. And give us no paragraphs and give us no essays, Chris. <laughs> You're the teacher at all. <laughs> have you read? Have you read any of my work or listened to anything that I say? I can't. I don't think or speak in single paragraphs. No punctuation. We'll try it. We'll try it. We'll try it. Oh no! This is going to be really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> right, so here we go. You ready, Chris? We're going in. Yeah. This is the lightning round. So let's yeah. like really quickly, whatever comes to mind, speak your mind, Chris, in one word or one sentence only. Okay, so my first question, what's one thing which you love, would you give up to be an even better writer? Uh, uh, if I love it, I wouldn't give it up. I, I, Pass, pass. I, 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 oh. If I love it, I wouldn't give it up. I like being a writer, but I don't want to give anything up for it. I was really hoping you weren't going to say something like your child or your mother. Or yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> okay, we move on. All right, you have to answer this one. Okay, okay Chris, okay. no more passes. I use my one. Right? I use my one pass. I get it. Yeah. That's the one pass you got. That's it. Done. It's over. Right. Public theater or Disney? Public. If you could tell your younger self something, what would it be? Calm down. <laughs> would you consider an unproduced play as incomplete? Yeah. Oh. What is the best money you ever spent as a writer? As a writer? Um, uh, as a writer, uh, best money I ever spent as a writer, probably buying a good... Hmm. As a writer, uh, 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 total total panic. Um, buying, buying, buying. I don't know. I like these pens. It's better, it's better than these pens. I'll do an ad. These are G twos. I spend a lot of money on G twos. G two. Life of a writer, right? Eh? Um. Uh, do you read your reviews and if so why in one sentence yeah my ego <laughs> hey uh, what are the three essential ingredients when writing a comedy Ooh. Uh, uh fearlessness um fuck you attitude and brevity. <laughs> I like number two. Um, name two of the greatest Latinx playwrights of all time. Oh my God, Kiara and Irene Fornes. So no, uh, you're done. You're done. You can breathe now, Chris. That's <laughs> it. It's over. <laughs> what I've learned from this: we need a countdown clock. You know, like you need a countdown clock because yeah. I would just I would take it forever. I'll just take all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna add a countdown clock for all the others <laughs> look Chris, i'm gonna email you guys it. back with a better answer than the g2 pens because that's not a good answer well i was thinking you say laptop or like <laughs> the laptop is good i was gonna say laptop but that felt corny and then i went corny so i don't know <laughs> no, it was fun thank you so so much chris this was so amazing and please come back please come back to yeah. btc writers room at a later date we'd love to have you back anytime anytime this is a pleasure congratulations to you guys and everything that you're doing and all the best